fishing has always been an important part of our culture in Puerto Rico. We fish to eat, we fish to live. And now, we know that fish is a limited resource. We know we must be responsible if we want to have fish for tomorrow, for the future. So we stop taking certain fish during their most vulnerable times in their life cycle. We stop so that they can continue. Some species of fish have an interesting form of reproduction whereby they gather in large numbers at specific locations and times of the year to reproduce. These are called fish spawning aggregations. Some species, such as large snappers and groupers, will aggregate in very large numbers only once or twice a year. The numbers could range from thousands to even tens of thousands of fishes. And they would come from distances of up to tens of kilometers away where they would uh, leave their home territories, come to the aggregation site and reside there just for a few days uh, during the aggregation time and then return to their home locations. Obviously this is an important time for this, the fish because they are putting all the reproductive effort into this one short period of time so it has to be successful to have successful reproduction. Equally obvious, fishermen have learned that this is a good opportunity to catch fish because the fish are there in um, large numbers. They are there at, at predictable locations and times, so it's, it's advantageous to, to fishermen. Unfortunately, we have found that this practice um, over several decades has proved to be unsustainable, and Continued fishing in this manner has led to an occasionally collapse of the spawning populations and the fisheries they support. These aggregations are so susceptible to overfishing because they are predictable in time and space. We became so good at fishing them that we drove some fish close to extinction and severely crippled others. Now, we must work to protect the fish during those reproductive times. Otherwise, we will have nothing in the future. But, at first, these aggregations are not always easy to find. Put it on yourself. I don't know if that's safe to die. <laughs> <laughs> if you forget you had something in there that you needed. <laughs> if you need an extra regulator, I'll just pull it out. Yeah, yeah. Underwater. Yeah, yeah. Really the goal and what we're looking for today is Nassau. So there might be, based on the passive acoustic monitoring from the past, there's a lot of like courtship associated sounds from that area. It's where we found like a Sama aggregation last year, but we've never really searched there during the prime time for Nassau, which is now. 
Locating fish spawning aggregations is a very difficult task, especially if it's not known through traditional ecological knowledge, where a fisher passes on the information from one generation to the next. You are essentially trying to find a needle in a haystack, searching miles of coastal shelf habitat in hopes of stumbling upon the exact right location at the exact right time. Fortunately for us though, a lot of these sites do share some similar geomorphological characteristics that do help us narrow the search down. However, it is still a very daunting task that is very diver intensive. In the case of groupers that are capable of producing sounds, we can use specialized equipment that record the soundscapes of these aggregation sites underwater. As groupers get together to aggregate, they make sounds that are species specific during the courtship associated activities performed at the aggregation sites. And as these calls become more intense or more frequent, we can use that as a proxy to determine when the correct timing of spawning is occurring. But with other species that do not produce sounds, we have to actually put divers in the water to verify that there are increased abundances of fish for the purpose of spawning at these sites. And basically, we're just doing long drift surveys over the suspected area, looking for increased abundances of fish, changes in coloration that would be indicative of spawning, swollen abdomens, or in the rare occurrence, actually witnessing spawning so. Since these aggregations can be difficult to locate, there are very few that are known for our island. Luckily, this team of scientists in Puerto Rico work over the course of three years to search for new aggregations using two different approaches. One in particular was completely unique. It involved sampling seawater and extracting DNA to detect the presence of fish. For the last two years, we have been uh, using uh, some relatively new genetic techniques uh, uh, to assess uh, the presence of uh, eDNA in uh, different environments. Uh, this technique is called uh, environmental DNA or eDNA uh, in short. And it's an excellent technique, um, uh, a non-invasive uh, uh, technique to be able to assess uh, things such as the biodiversity of uh, different groups of uh, animals in certain environments. You can uh, sample um, uh, soil, you can sample water, you can even uh, sample air, and you can uh, extract DNA out of those uh, different environments and uh, catalog the biodiversity uh, of uh, the targeted groups that you're interested. At the same time, another big advantage of those techniques is that they're non-invasive. You don't need to collect fish, you don't need to collect corals, but just by accessing the uh, DNA that is, 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 a, is in the environment, uh, you can have a very good picture of the current biodiversity of, of, uh, of the habitat you're studying.
For one aspect of this project, we collected seawater and sediment samples at known fish spawning aggregation sites with the purpose of trying to detect the presence of those target fish at their respective sites. So for example, if we collected seawater and sediment at a known Nassau grouper or red hind aggregation, and then we extracted the DNA from those samples, would we be able to pick up on the fact that Nassau grouper or red hind was actually present at those sites? And I know that this is essentially like looking for a needle in the haystack, but we hypothesize that this would, in theory, be possible considering the fact that those fish are located at these sites in much higher numbers during the spawning times of the year versus the non-spawning times of the year. We sampled these locations for the presence of DNA using three different methodologies. The first two were diver-based, where divers descended down to the aggregation site core and collected both water and sediment samples from these locations. Since DNA can virtually be found anywhere, we wanted to make sure that we sampled both the water column and also the sediments at these sites. The third was a boat-based collection methodology where we lowered a horizontal water sampler down throughout the water column, which was designed to close and collect water samples close to the seafloor. Knowing what fish diversity is present at these spawning aggregation sites can actually tell us a lot about what occurs in these areas besides just spawning activity. So aside from looking for specific fish species, we also just wanted to know the general fish diversity of these areas. And so over the course of three years, we collected hundreds of water and sediment samples from these sites, extracted that information, and have now developed a pretty detailed uh, idea of what fish and other organisms are living or traveling through these spawning aggregation sites. But this wasn't the only way that the team searched for fish aggregations. They also used historical information and teamed up with local fishers to help out. And the results? We were able to find two new aggregations throughout the course of the study using a combination of traditional ecological knowledge provided by fishers and passive acoustic monitoring. The first aggregation was for the Nassau grouper, which is protected in the local and federal waters of Puerto Rico and is listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened. Until this project, there was only one other known Nassau grouper aggregation in Puerto Rico waters. The second aggregation was for mutton snapper, a commercially important species in the local waters of Puerto Rico. Both species are under protection. The Nassau grouper is closed all year. The mutton snapper is under seasonal protection, meant to protect it during its reproductive period. Having historical information on fishing activity and locations was important for narrowing down the search area for spawning aggregations. However, historical data is often vague and incomplete. So in this study, we hired several current fishers to help us with the search, and they took us to alternative places and other places that they normally fish. Without their help, we would not have been able to narrow down the, the search in both space and time, albeit with lots of uh, diving activity, to get the uh, exact positions and times for the two spawning aggregations that we did encounter and document. The results of the eDNA portion of our project found an incredible amount of reef fish diversity at these sites, and we were able to detect the presence of a few of our target species at their aggregations. But aside from finding just that enormous amount of more demersal, more resonant reef fish, we were also able to detect the presence of organisms that pass through these areas rather quickly, such as sharks. And so what this shows us is that this eDNA sampling technique of using water and sediment is a reliable tool to be able to characterize fish diversity in these tropical systems. Assessing in DNA in open ocean is a difficult task. There are a lot of limitations that we have taken into consideration for our study. Uh, for example, uh, UV radiation can degrade uh, eDNA relatively fast. 
we had to deal with uh, ocean currents that can disperse very rapidly the uh, DNA that we we're looking for and also the uh, generally the environment of a uh, warm tropical uh, water is uh, is uh, hostile to the quality of, uh, of uh, DNA however Despite all these uh, limitations uh, in our project, we have uh, successfully applied these techniques and we have um, uh, detected uh, large amounts of diversity in the habitats uh, we were studying. Now we are aware of other locations where these fish gather to contribute to their next generation. Finding fish should not be as challenging as it is in our present time. But, perhaps, with more opportunities for fishers and scientists to work together, we can achieve the same output that we are all aiming for. More fish. Until then, we will continue to comply with the closures in place to protect this finite resource.